Radio.org. A tune-in radio station, part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. host and guest and are not necessarily supported by WPSC 88.7 FM, station management or the station owner, William Patterson University. Anyone wanting to offer differing opinions may do so by calling the show at 973-720-2738. Abusive callers will be rejected. Now here's your program on WP 88.7 FM Brave New Radio. Good morning, good morning. Good morning to you. Yes, indeed. Here's your program on WP 88.7 FM and GoBrave.org, Brave New Radio. Those of you who listen regularly, if you've tuned in, you know it's time for another edition of The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. My guest is already in the studio with me here this morning live. You know, normally I have my guests calling from around the country and from around the world they're usually on the telephone but then when I have a local author or a local guest they take me up on my challenge and actually come on into the studio and have the studio experience and my guest has done that this morning he is sitting to my left so we're gonna get on with our morning ritual and routine as we always do you know I give you the weather I read from two books I introduce my guest then we go to a public service announcement and we come back we resume with our interview so you know that already and you also know what I asked you to do I asked you to get on all of your social media sites every last one of them regardless of which ones you're on and let someone know that the reading circle is indeed on the air and particularly if you're an educator this show is not limited just to educators but if you are an educator you won't want to miss this show and if you're an educator who is looking to turn his or her school around or to turn his or her classroom around you definitely won't want to miss this show because we're going to be talking about some strategies and ideas that you can use simple ideas strategies common sense ideas and then the book that we're going to be talking about you can order that book and it's an easy read it's not something that's like volumes it's not voluminous it's not huge it's not like one of the big binders that we make and all that it's something that you can get through relatively quickly and implement the strategies quickly so if you know of an educator make sure you wake them up because they say the early bird gets the worm wake them up so that the early birds can certainly get this worm that we're going to be talking about this morning because it is going to be worth it and again if you're not an educator the practices and the principles work regardless of what business you're in, really, because, again, they're, they're, they're strategies that you can use, and a lot of them are common sense strategies, human nature type strategies that we often overlook. So let somebody know that the Reading Circle is on the air. I'm going to go ahead now and share that weather with you, <clears throat> brought to you right here from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. Right now, 59.8 degrees, and we're expecting showers early, then partly cloudy for the afternoon. Let's see what we got going on for the rest of the days. Uh, Clear skies tonight, then tomorrow, Sunday, 69 as a high. Matter of fact, today, 69 is going to be the high, 41 as the low. Tomorrow, a repeat, 69 as a high, 45 as a low, mainly sunny. Clear Sunday night, and then on Monday, partly cloudy skies. We're going to zoom on up to 78 with a low of 52. Showers early becoming steady light rain on Monday night. Then on Tuesday, rain likely, thunder possible. High of 59, low of 40, cloudy early on Tuesday night, and the sun pops back out again on Wednesday, 67 as a high, 41 degrees as a low. Mostly clear sky on Wednesday night. And again, that weather is brought to you right here from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center.
Well, as you also know, I kicked the show off, as I said, reading from two books, and it just sets a positive vibe for the rest of the morning. Not trying to do any preaching, not proselytizing, not converting, not doing any of that. It's just that these particular two books, they start off with a positive message, and they're they're daily devotionals, so they don't have a year attached to them. They have dates, but not years. So for today, April 23rd, a perfect heart, and I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh to the touch of their God, sensitive and responsive to the touch of their God. Although we don't behave perfectly all the time, it is possible for us to have a perfect heart toward God. That means that we love him wholeheartedly and we want to please him and do what is right. When we receive Jesus as the perfect sacrifice for our sins, he gives us a new heart and puts his spirit in us. The heart he gives us is a grateful, pure and perfect heart toward him. I like to say that he gives us a new want to. He gives us a desire to please him. All God really wants is for us to love him and out of that love do the best we can to serve and obey him. If we do the best we can each day, even though our best is still imperfect, God sees our hearts and views us as perfect anyway because of his grace. Undeserved favor and blessing. Prayer of thanks. I thank you today, Father, that you, have, you see the attitude of my heart. I know that you have given me a new want to and with your help, I am going to do my best to please you with my actions. I love you, Father, and I thank you for your grace in my life. While we're on that vein, I know Passover kicked off last night. Started celebrating that. Everybody celebrating Passover. Have a wonderful time as we go back and reflect and celebrate. And for today, April 23rd, Out of Until Today by Ian Van Zant. She says, I am willing to acknowledge a mistake is a lesson in humility and a powerful healing opportunity. Very often we waste time, energy and readily available joy because of our failure to acknowledge an error. We know that pencils have erasers. We know that computers allow us to cut and paste. We know that tests can be taken again and the wrong sizes can be exchanged. Yet for some strange reason, one of our greatest challenges is admitting to ourselves and others that we have made a mistake. Perhaps as children, we were spanked for breaking things or criticized for shortcomings. Maybe those who raised us want so badly for us to be good that they left us little margin for error. Perhaps we believe that it is not safe to acknowledge or admit an error. Maybe we have heard so much about human errors that have caused great tragedy, hardship or heartache that we are simply afraid to say, quote, I made a mistake, unquote. This simple statement is a powerful acknowledgement that there is spiritual power in human weakness. A mistake is a great opportunity for learning and for healing. A mistake reminds us that no matter how old we are, how smart we believe ourselves to be, regardless of how we have accomplished what we are still human. A mistake is a lesson in humility. A mistake is the way we learn our limitation. It is a reminder that there is always more for us to learn about ourselves and capabilities. When we grow in humility to a place where we can acknowledge, accept, and admit our mistakes, we grow in compassion for ourselves and others as we learn to surrender and heal our judgments. Until today, acknowledging a mistake may have caused you for fear or caused you fear, anxiety, anguish, or shame. Just for today, embrace your humanness. If you have made a mistake today, acknowledge it. If you have made one in the past that has had lingering effects, admit it. Today, I am willing to acknowledge and admit I am human enough to make mistakes. That's from the book Until Today by Ian LeVanzant. <clears throat> it is now time for me to introduce my guests. And as I said, most, I'll say 90% of the time, my guests are on the telephone with me because they're not here in New Jersey. They're from other states around the country and sometimes around the world. But this guest is right here with me in the studio. And he's from here. And I'm going to get him introduced right now. My guest is Robert Kravitz. And he is a nationally recognized educator and consultant. Upon graduating from Rutgers University in 1990, Robert began a business selling desserts to local restaurants. While still operating this business, Robert returned to school to obtain a culinary arts degree and both an MA in educational leadership and an MBA from St. Peter's University. 
After spending over 10 years building his own company to over $1 million in revenue, Robert stepped out of the entrepreneurial world and into an inner city classroom in Jersey City, New Jersey. Robert's experience with all of entrepreneurship's responsibilities from obtaining a small business administration loan to purchasing a building, hiring and firing employees, and dealing with all types of clients made him a natural fit to teach business. After spending almost five years teaching the subject to high school students in Jersey City and Fort Lee, New Jersey, he transitioned into a role as a school administrator. As an assistant principal and principal, Robert led Fort Lee's elementary, middle, and high schools. For the last three years, he has served as superintendent of schools of Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey. And beginning in October 2015, Robert will be the superintendent of schools in Inglewood, New Jersey. He's already in that post now because clearly October has passed. National recognition. Even after becoming principal of Fort Lee School No. 3, Robert's educational philosophy remained shaped by his experiences in business. That's right. Robert brought an entrepreneurial spirit to the school. Culture began to change, and in 2010, school number three was recognized as a United States National Blue Ribbon School. In 2012, Robert was appointed superintendent of schools for Inglewood Cliffs, where he currently serves. Actually, now he's in Inglewood. Outside of his work with the district, he is the author of Blue Ribbon Story and Entrepreneur's <clears throat> entrepreneur's success in education and an educational consultant. Robert's experiences in business have guided his path in education and he uses the specialized knowledge to consistently deliver results and value as an administrator and consultant. We welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones, Robert Kravitz. Robert, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Oh, congratulations, first off, on turning the school around into a blue ribbon school. Thank you. Please That's the do. first thing. We were talking about that as we were waiting to get in. And as those of you know, whenever I'm not doing radio, my day job is a school administrator. And I was sharing with Robert how when I first stepped into the building that I'm in now, I stepped on the stage in front of the staff and said, we are going to be a Blue Ribbon School. And I was sharing with him that the staff looked at me like I had three heads. <laughs> oh, in, in my office are the words, we believe, we believe in everywhere, on the walls, uh, everywhere I go, I sign every letter. We believe. I believe. We can do it. Absolutely. I mean, that that's right off the bat is with the first step. Uh, let's see. I think over my office, one of the teachers actually bought it for me this past Christmas. It's a long, big plaque that says, believe you can achieve it or something along those lines. And I've always had on my door, every building I go to, I have this little plaque that I post on the door. It says, we are well able to conquer it. Well, that's the and same theories in business, actually. Yes. And that's why if you look at the great companies like Apple and Google, they, they want people to believe in success and they only want the best for success. And Absolutely. That's the mentality education has to have. It really does. And we're going to talk about that as we talk about his book, because that's one of the common sense strategies I was talking about that Robert has in the book. And, and again, it's something that's very basic, but so many people overlook. Or maybe they don't believe in it themselves. They may think it's, ah, that's that puffy, fluffy stuff. We don't, you know, we have to deal with the data. And, yeah, we do have to deal with the data, but there's other things we can deal with along with the data that helps out in terms of, if you were saying, culture and climate and belief, philosophy, core beliefs, all of those different things. Really, if you want to move a building has to be in place you want to move a classroom has to be in place you want to move a student has to be in place all of those so you we're want to going move to your life as well absolutely, yes, everything absolutely. Has to be it's connected right? you're right i mean it really is and that's where the philosophy and the core and everything comes through i did my m ed here for for education and the dean michael chiricello we started the class whenever we first got together and his whole premise has always been who you are as a person is who you are as the leader well that's why every class starts with 30 people and ends with 10 or 15 <laughs> because those who believe they can do it actually show up and actually do the work that's absolutely that's right so I'm going to do what we do in terms of what I have to do I'm going to share a public service announcement with you and while I'm doing that you are going to if there is such a thing as multitask because people debate that they say no there's no such thing as you can only do one thing at a time believe like, you okay. can believe you can <laughs> <laughs> but we are going to share with you a PSA and while I'm doing that I want you to get up and text somebody get your mobile device I'll call them get on all your social media sites let someone know that Robert Kravitz is on the air with me we are talking education
Thanks, Julie. And coming up next, is there rain in your weekend forecast? We'll find... Hey. Hi. It's been a while. Great place and nice neighborhood. You must have a strong community association board. Thanks. I guess so, but I don't pay any attention to that stuff. Seriously? How do you know for sure the board and community manager are making the right decisions to protect your investment? I don't, but what am I supposed to do? You can get involved and connect with CAI. CA what? CAI, Community Associations Institute, they're a nonprofit group that has helped us build a great community. They have free resources for your association board, professional training for community managers, and helpful information for homeowners. Thanks. I'll definitely do that. Is the time and investment you have made in your home and community protected? Be a smart homeowner and visit CAI at ResponsibleCommunities.com. I love you. <laughs> to a child. It's just something else to play with. Lock it up, because 1.7 million children in the U.S. are living with unlocked and loaded guns. Get involved at ceasefireusa.org. You're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley on Brave New Radio. Yes, indeed, you are. You're listening to The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. My guest this morning is Robert L. Kravitz, and he tells me he's no relation to Lenny. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he is the author of Blue Ribbon Story and Entrepreneur's Success in Education. We have testimony in the back. Robert Kravitz hits the nail on the head in his book by casting light on the problems of education, including administration, communication, and parental involvement. It is a must-read for anyone who cares not only about their child's education, but also for the education of children across this country. I recommend it enthusiastically and without reservation. That's from Paige Saltano, PTA President, Fort Lee, New Jersey. So, okay, Robert, we're going to take this all the way back to the beginning. Matter of fact, ultimately, we're going to work our way up to the writing of the book. Okay. But in terms of your philosophies and your thoughts and, and, and being able to go into business, where did that all come from? Well, I I actually went to Rutgers University, as you mentioned before. I started as a music major, went in as a music major, political science, and thought that I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. Um, After graduating from Rutgers, I switched to business, actually, after a year and said, who wants to do this? Um, Displacement Displacement theory of entrepreneurship, right place, right time, met a pastry chef who said to me, you're an interesting guy, you're a salesman. Why don't you sell some cakes? And I said, sure, let's try it. Let's give it a whirl. And it took off. But of course, with anything, you need to know what you're doing. So then I went back to school again and got a culinary degree. So here I was with a business degree from Rutgers University. Now I have just attained an associate's degree in culinary arts. I need to sell cakes. And I started selling it. And the business took off and took off and find out what the people want. How do you listen to your customers? That's the key, right? So you're listening to your customers. Business is growing. Business is growing. Went back and got an MBA. Again, listening to the academic side, but also realizing this, there's a real world to this. Understanding people. How do you service that customer? Um, was fortunate enough to have the business grow to over a million dollars in sales annually. And then I became the Ben & Jerry's wholesale distributor for the state of New Jersey. And I said, wow, this is great. And then my wife, who, who's a teacher, said to me, you work all the time. When are we going to have kids? I need to see you. Let's do something together. So switched careers and started teaching. And, and in the education world, it's hard to, to jump right in. But I was fortunate enough to get into a charter school in Jersey City. And I loved it. I loved it. It was a passion. It was teaching kids the real thing. So I would show them the books that say, this is how you write a business plan. And then I would show them my business plan and say, this is how I got an SBA loan. This is really what happens when you sit there. It's not as easy, but here's how you do it. 
and it, it took off. It was great. Loved teaching, but I wanted something a little closer. I went to Fortley High School. Same thing, same theory, same dem- different demographic group, but a same idea. I'm selling the concept of education to kids. And then the parents the same way. You know, there's nothing wrong with getting parents involved, whether they're in Jersey City or in Fort Lee. You just call them. A parent is a parent. I'm a parent. Everybody's. If you have kids, you're parents. Nobody has ever said to me, I don't want anything. I want things bad for my kids. We want good. So I was fortunate. And then I was the business guy. So when there was a problem in the school system, give it to the business guy. Yearbooks traditionally lose money in, in schools. Give it to the business guy. The first year we made a profit of $25,000. Got called into the office. What are you doing? I said, I don't know. I, I advertise. This is how we do it. No, this is education. We don't make a profit. Okay. Uh, second year, I did it again. A smaller profit. Got called in again. Told me, you're not long for this job. I said, okay, what am I long for? They said, to be the next assist, as administrator in the building. So I was the assistant principal of Fort Lee High School. Um, and, and it was great. Redid the whole thing, and then they had a failing school. They took a vote of no confidence of the principal. They had 66% of the kids were passing at the time the NJ asked. What do you do? Give it to the business guy. I knew nothing about education. I knew about cakes. I knew about business. Walked into a room with a bunch of teachers. Actually took them all outside and said, look, again, business concept, fresh air, fresh beginning. Opened up the doors. What would you like to do? Because I don't know. Humility. You know, you talked about that in your reading in the beginning. It's all about being humble. Um, So they said, listen, we don't like this newfangled program. Great. I don't know it. Throw it out. (laughs) Asked the custodian to bring over a dumpster. We threw out things. Next thing you know, they said, we like teaching basic math. Okay. Everybody's making flashcards. We like teaching basic English. Remember the old way where you underdine the noun. Not a sparkle word or not any fancy word. A noun, two lines for a verb, circle the direct. And they loved it. And the parents can relate because that's what they learned the same way. So there's your parent connection. And suddenly the scores went from 66% to 90%. And the U.S. Department of Education contacted me and said, what did you do? And I said, nothing. We taught basic stuff from the beginning. We started to bring back cursive handwriting. Why? Because there's a reason why the occupational therapy costs. That's right. Occupational therapy costs are expensive for school districts. Why? Because in the old days, you used to train your mu- your muscles to write, but now we stopped doing that. So, scores went up. They said, do it again. We went to 93% the second year. In November of 10, 2010, I was invited to Washington, D.C., as flipping a failing school to a Blue Ribbon school in one year. There were 300 principals in the entire United States. Blue Ribbon schools are one-tenth of one, one percent of population of schools in the United States. So it was great. And then in, and then actually in 2012, uh, the, the New Jersey state budget listed our school as the second lowest cost per pupil with the second highest test results. Why? Because we didn't use anything that was fancy. We taught basic stuff, and the scores were jumping. Uh, I enjoyed some time there in Fort Lee, and then I had an opportunity to go to a very affluent district, Englewood Cliffs. And again, reading your customer. What do you want? Uh, they, it was a, they wanted languages. So we brought in the first immersion languages in Spanish, French, and Italian. Again, within the same budget, funded by foreign governments. So all we were doing was teaching what the parents wanted, creating a program, and that was the buy-in. When you have buy-in, you can sell anything. When I had buy-in from chefs, I could sell them cakes. When I had buy-in from parents, I could sell them what they wanted. Listen, we even brought in Dale Carnegie training for the teachers because it was a different kind of district. That How do you listen to a parent? You know, That's part of the learning process. So I always talk about a triangle where there's a parent, a teacher, an administrator. The administrator holds the purse strings. The teacher has to be on board and that parent. And if you put the child in the middle of that triangle, it's like an arrowhead for success. And it's worked in my career. Fortunately, uh, again, three years of success. And actually last year I was honorable mention for New Jersey School Board's Visionary Leader of the Year. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Again, all Jews listening and I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. That's it. I, 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 I'm just a regular guy who, who is trying to put this together. And and now I'm in Englewood, New Jersey, which is a challenge, but it's a great challenge. It's great opportunities. 
one of the most important things for those in a listening audience, I mean, if we actually were in a classroom, I would be now challenging you to see if you were paying attention to what Robert was saying. But there was one key thing that Robert said that many people overlook. And that's that whole aspect. And he, and he hit it right there. If you notice in the beginning, he didn't say anything about academics. He said the relationships, the people. And once you get the people, that's whenever you have the ability to move into the other areas. Matter of fact, one of the parts in the book says from selling scones to selling smiles. And we were talking before we went on the air in terms of this whole notion of having fun, laughing. And I'm a big believer now. I'm sitting here. He's probably looking because I had this like huge smile on my face as he was talking. Because what he's saying for me is confirmation and affirmation of my whole philosophy of how I do things in the building that I run as well. Because, again, people think, yeah, that's nice. It's all good. That's fluff. That's not. They don't realize how important those things are. Yep. Uh, I was called when, when our scores jumped. They said, what'd you do? You must have cheated. It, you're very slick. And I said, no, it's if you smile. If you, The children knew it. They wanted to be happy. Right. Who doesn't want to be happy? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I do this. I teach at, at St. Peter's University, and I teach education classes, and I always talk about school finance. And I do the very same thing that we teach our kindergarten kids, and actually younger. And here's a song for those people out there listening. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Yeah. Right? Now, Mark, you're smiling, and I'm sure a lot of people out there have a little start to have a grin. It didn't cost me any money. Right. And I changed your attitude for if that for a split second, but there was that smile, and the smile makes the difference. Um, you know, it's again, it's from business the same way selling. I could show you a stack of cards of all the rejections, but I had the small stack of my customers, and those are my customers, those are the people who respected me and worked with me and, and wanted to buy my products. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you just keep smiling, right? Just like Dory did in in in. Uh, in Finding Nemo, you do the same thing. No, it's true. And that aspect of it is so crucial. The whole thing of knowing people. I have one, one of my teachers that we talk all the time. He says, you seem to have this gift of, of knowing how to deal with people. And I said, that's half the battle. I mean, because if you can get that, as a matter of fact, that's the bulk of the battle. The rest, if you get people to love you and not are fearful of you or respect you, they'll pretty much do what you ask them to do. And but once you get them to think it's their ideal of what are the whole persuasion uh, definition of getting people to do what you want them to do and having them think it was what they wanted to do to begin with, it, they'll, they'll do it. Like you say, with the parents and everything else, it's there. And the, the skills are transferable. Like you said, you went from entrepreneurship, and we were talking right before we went on air, the difference between being in someone else's business and creating your own. And I want to talk a little bit about that, how you explain that to me whenever we were so off here. When we talk about business, big, business is a um, – business. when people talk about business and education, they say, oh, someone's going to come in and cut. That's the accountant, right? We're going to cut everything. But an entrepreneur is not a businessman. An entrepreneur is a business person that's looking at things differently, taking the same resource and how can I get a better result? How can I change? How can how, how did Google was started as an entrepreneurial venture? What more do people want? A faster way for them to search information. Uh, Apple, we want a different computer that's easier to use. We want a phone that gives us more information. It didn't say we we're going to get rid of phones, but we want it more. We want something different. That's what people look for. All right, if you've just joined us, my guest this morning is the superintendent of schools in Inglewood, New Jersey, Robert L. Kravitz. Interestingly enough, this morning you have the superintendent and the principals. I'm in the superintendent's office. <laughs> they always tease the kids and the teachers about going to the principal's office. Well, I'm in the superintendent. That's why they tease principals like, uh-oh, you got called to the superintendent's office. But this morning, uh, it's the superintendent and the principal, and we're talking about education. We're actually talking about Mr. Kravitz's book, soon to be Dr. Kravitz. We're talking about his book, Blue Ribbon Story, and Entrepreneur's Success in Education. And... Again, we're working our way through. Matter of fact, when we come back from the information that I'm sharing with you, we're going to talk about chapter one title, the title of it, the state of education, because I that is I'm quite sure a topic that is debated and knocked back and forth like a tennis ball. I am sure. So we're going to talk about his thoughts on the state of education and just talking to him and listening to him. 
And having read the book, <laughs> we're going to be in for a treat in the first chapter. So, all right, I'm going to, you know what to do again. Get on all your social media sites. Let someone know that Robert is on the air with me. We have the superintendent and the principal here in the same studio. And we're giving our thoughts on education. Now, this is, this is the thing. <clears throat> it's one thing to talk about, I want to turn a school around. It's another thing to have turned one around. And for those of us who are wise, <laughs> we will take the tips, strategies, and tactics from those of us who did it and then implement some of those same things with the belief that, you know what, if I try this strategy and this tactic, pretty much we'll get similar results. Um, so that's what we're doing this morning. So again, if you're an educator or if you know of an educator, tell them to wake up. Tell them you want to hear this because you got a superintendent and a principal on the air. We're talking about some strategies to turn things around. And it's not necessarily, and we're going to talk about this when we rejoin when we get back together a couple of minutes it's not necessarily just about the test score while the test score yes is important it's not all about the test score so when we talk about turning around a school we're not talking about just turning around the score results we're talking about turning around a culture we're talking about turning around a belief system we're talking about turning around or touching lives because at the end of the day what robert and i do is about the kids it really is. So I'm going to share this information with you, let somebody know we're there, and then we're going to continue when we come back talking about the state of education. Having a place to go after school will make you a better student. Having an outlet to express yourself will make you a better artist. Having something to do together will make you a better family. At The Y, we're helping build better friends, listeners, writers, swimmers, scientists, and musicians one chance at a time. Give the gift of opportunity Support the Y at ymca.net. The Y for a better us. If you own a gun, you have a full time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. How can I make money in the music business? Why copyright? Should I make a CD anymore? Trying to break into the music and entertainment biz? Wondering how the business works? Wondering how guys like Elton John and MC Hammer go bankrupt? Why am I not making any cash? Tune in to WP Brave New Radio every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. Hang with the university's music business faculty hosts, me, Steve Marconi. And me, Dave Phil. Plus, we'll have industry guests and students from the music management program. How do I get gigs down at the shore? Call in with your questions and hear the latest in industry happenings. How do I get my music on iTunes? How do I get on a tour? It's Music Biz 101 and more every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Only on WP Brave New Radio. Your secretary's got our checks, right? Mine's direct deposit, I think. <laughs> the Reading Circle on WP 88.7 FM. Yes, indeed. You are listening to The Reading Circle as I was teasing as we went into the PSA. Yeah, I have the superintendent and the principal here together. I'm sitting here in the superintendent's office. And believe it or not, we can learn from each other. And I'm sitting in here getting a lesson myself with the superintendent. You're actually my second superintendent I've been with this week that wasn't my own. Oh. Um, the superintendent from Halden came to my school to see our breakfast in the classroom program. They're thinking about implementing it up here at Halden. And our school was selected as the site to come because we do it well. And so I was honored and happy with that. It was Dr. Miguel Hernandez. Uh, Miguel came over, and we had a good conversation as well. So I guess this is my week to be with the superintendent. Well, we, we do. We actually do. Uh, I've been doing breakfast with the superintendent um, in districts, and, and it's for parents to come in, and I don't even have a set agenda. It's talk. Let's talk about anything they want to know about it, what's happening in education, any questions. As long as it's not personnel, we're good. Right. And uh, we just have conversations, and it's nice. It's a la relaxed atmosphere, and it works out very well as a, at that line of communication that I'm here. I'm the face. You have questions. You know, I am the CEO of a company, right. and, and that's it. And sometimes that makes the difference. It made the difference when selling, you know, when you get to see the CEO of the company, and it gets the, it's the difference in schools the same way. Chapter 1, The State 
of education. Oh boy, um, what are we doing in yes, education? Yes, he starts right off. What are all the people in education doing? Why are children failing? People have so many ideas, but I've heard very few identify the real problem. Go. Well, you know, it's it's as I mentioned to you, what raised the test scores. It's basic stuff. Go, go, walk around your neighborhood, ladies and gentlemen. Walk around the, and see kids are they're, they're on computers. I, when I grew up, we played outside. We learned interactions. When I uh, grew up, I did homework. I, I didn't ha- go on a computer and do it. As I mentioned before about writing and, and learning how to flex those finger muscles so that you don't have occupational po- occupational therapy costs. These are the things that are, are changing. We're looking for easy ways for kids to get A's, and then everybody gets an A, and then everybody wins. And I, I, as a father, I have coached soccer, where PAL used to stand for Police Athletic League, and now it stands for Parents Allowed to Leave, <laughs> where parents leave me with, you know, 15 soccer players. And I'm saying, I'm the only guy here helping? Um, you know, I think it's a different time, and people don't realize that. And it, and if it is a different time, what do, what are we trying to do? And and you know, how do you fix a problem if you don't identify that problem? And that uh, that problem is we want kids to read, we want kids to write, we want kids to do math, and you know, training the brain to memorize things. When we were in, in school, we learned poetry, and, and we had to memorize it. And if you look at the rest of the world, the industrialized nations and, you know, Western Europe and Asia, they still memorize. They stand in front of their classes and memorize poetry. We've stopped doing that because why? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't. I don't think there are answers out there. Well, interestingly enough, as I've read the book and we talked earlier and I've heard you as we've been going through the interview, it sounds like you – have a belief system of going back to the basics. It, it's always the basics, right? It's, it's when I went to sell. Right. It, there are people who will sell over the internet, but people who walk in and introduce themselves, shake hands. They're called soft skills. They used to be called life skills, but now they're called soft skills, where you would learn how to shake someone's hand, learn how to speak to someone, learn how to deal with people. Um, you know, failure is a great thing to learn. The greatest, it really is. The greatest leaders of the world have failed at many things. Absolutely, and I tell folks all the time because again, I'm in some respects, I'm kind of counter to the way we're doing things in education. And when I say that, I agree with you a zillion percent. We've tossed out the basics. This is what this is what I observe. We toss out the basics. We bring in all these highfalutin programs. At millions of dollars. At millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. We do that for two or three or four years. And then as we go down the line, the question comes up, how come the kid can't do the basic? How come the kid can't cursive write? How come the kid can't multiply? How come? Well, we took that out of the curriculum for this highfalutin program. So then the brainstorm will come up, oh, we got to go back to the basics. But in the meantime, you've lost three or four years of grade levels of kids who don't know how to do it now. Six years. Because it's it, for every year... It's two years to unteach and then reteach. And that's what people don't realize. I mean, it, it, I, I always tell teachers and administrators when I teach, it's just like your own kids. If you don't set the example, show right. them what you want. I mean, I have my, my, my oldest son, you know, like just like every other child, doesn't keep a clean room. Oh, sure. And he doesn't know. So what do you do? You model it. So, right. So you clean it. Right. And I take the picture and I put it on the wall. And I say, this is what my expectation of your room should look like. If we don't, then, then there's a problem. <laughs> but, no, you're right. You're but, absolutely right. But people don't do that anymore. And, and people don't do that in education because what's the quick fix? You know, as a high school teacher, I remember kids would say, is your class an AP class? Well, right. if, I, if I get your class, can I get an A, but do I have to take the test? You're right. Well, what about hard work? Right. My wife is a language teacher. The thought of kids graduating high school today with languages, and then they can't speak the language because they really just wanted the grade. They just, what's the next step? Uh, I think that's where we're losing focus. It's about education. No, it really is. And in terms of, I tell folks, the teachers, the kids, the parents, look, we're trying to prepare your child to be successful in society. All right. That's what I was talking about earlier in terms of, yes, we want test scores. But beyond the test score, we need your child to be able to function in the world. And that's success, right? So so people define success with tests. It's not about a test. Right. People, it's about Am, are you happy? Are you happy? Can you communicate? Can you, and if you don't communicate, do you have other means of communication? Finding out that. You know, just, I, 
in dealing with in business when I was selling desserts right. every chef was different some wanted to be left alone and liked the soft sell some wanted the hard sell that had to come in and you know how to be catered to and and some wanted to just talk but that's what you'd need to last year I was fortunate in, in Englewood Cliffs New Jersey again I brought in Dale Carnegie training and and people said well, well why are you doing that because it's a business model that's worked and that's what people don't do. They, they look for the quick fix, the business model that says, how do you deal with parents? Set your goals. And I ask the teachers all the time this, and the parents the same way. Have you ever expressed that to the teacher? Have you ever said, no, I want to go right to the principal. I want to go right to the superintendent. <laughs> but you need to have a conversation. Start. Start your way. And you, guess what? You know, I, I just said this to my seven-year-old. You get more sugar from honey than you do from vinegar, right? And, and work with me. I'll work with you. No, you. In terms of that, I, I, I have three other administrators in my building. It's the principal, and I actually have three vice principals. And each one of us has our own personalities and so forth. So, if think in terms of a teacher, one is a very hard marker. One is more a little bit more. I'll work with you, ish like. But it's a good balance. So the teachers kind of know which one of us, in terms of observations and evaluations, kind of where they're gonna gonna net out. But I always tell you know the, the VPs that I'm serving like you got to work with them. You cannot go in there and beat them all the way down and then expect them that they're just going to want to come back up. You got to work back to the relationship thing again. It's the same thing with the parents. You can't come in there and constantly berate them and their children, and then expect them. There's a because because back to to Robert's point. There's a connection between and I'm going to keep going through that as we go through the, the the interview. There's a direct relationship with your ability to work with people to get the expected results on and both that's sides on both sides on, on that triangle right so you yes. have the administrator you have that parent and you have the teacher because the, all three have to have that expectation to work so a teacher can't come in and say i'm the best and that's the way it is a parent ha can't come in and say my kid is and that's what i talk about in my book exactly identify your kid i have three kids those people who have kids they know which one is wh where do the, what's their specialty what they like, what they don't like. Be realistic. Right. And if we can sit down That's right. and be realistic, we can fix it. You know, you asked about the state of education. Schools were founded on a community. Correct. That kids would walk to school, meet their teacher, work together, have the conversation. That's what's missing. That's what's missing. Absolutely. I tell parents all the time, I said, look, I have four girls and wow, I can tell you, yeah, I couldn't buy <laughs> Four a Four weddings, there you could go. Could not buy a wedding, that's right. So I says, I will never say what my child will or will not do. I will tell you what they were taught, but once they leave my sight, I can't tell you. Now, I can only believe, hope, and pray that everything that we've taught them is what they will do when they're not in our presence. Because and I'm saying that to say parents will come in and say, oh, my child would never do that. Oh, my child, that's not my baby. No, my child, he doesn't do that at home. She doesn't do that at home. Well, your baby's doing it here. And that's back to the realistic point you were just talking about. You have to be realistic about your child. And, and, and it's realistic about yourself and yes. everything else. And it's, it's just a life approach, right? The same way with that, as I said, the teacher and the administrator. Be realistic. You could go into, an, into, a, into a building and put your feet up and be wonderful. You're the, you're the new CEO. And whether, again, whether you're an educator or right. you're a business. And that will work for a certain period of time before everybody says, I don't like working for this guy. <laughs> so what do you do? It's true. So you leave and you go work for right. someone who inspires you, who you say, right. I enjoy working for that person. Whether you work at a restaurant, whether you work at a, a corporate offices, a real estate agency, it doesn't matter. It's who inspires you it's to want to work for someone. It, it really is. In terms of, again, back to the relation, it is critical. And I don't think people understand the importance of this either. Robert is a superintendent and just and again I don't know this is our first time meeting other than email and LinkedIn so forth and so on. but I will bet dollars to donuts that you visit your school buildings so what I do um, is I deliver I hand deliver see? a birthday card to every employee see I have 565 <laughs> employees every one of them gets a birthday card from me on their birthday uh, if school's closed I mail it to them and, and wait wait because I was going to say you heard him say hand delivered correct okay so I remember again my years working at the at the telecommunications company, uh, Robert, and we had gotten a new director. He had just come in. I think he was. I was at AT and T. I think he had just come in from Sprint or one of the other companies. 
But when he first got there, he went just like you just said. He went to every office, introduced himself, shook the hand, looked eye to eye. And the employees were blown away because we had not had directors that had done that. And just that little gesture got everybody on his side. Oh, I want to work with Mr. Such and said, Oh, did you did Mr. Such and Such come into your office? And I always remembered that. And I will bet as the superintendent, particularly the more you do that, the less people think that you're coming to try to catch them up. It, they, they don't think it's a gotcha. No, it's it's wonderful. It's approached it. And and they want to talk. Yes. Hey, thank you for the card. Yes. Do you know what I do? No, show me what you do. Tell me what you do. And that's when I'm learning more and more about what's actually going on and how the great things are happening, but nobody recognizes that. Right. So that's that personal touch. That's that handshake. Right. That's that thank you. That's the difference that we lose in education, but also in society, right? And that's what we're missing. And those are the, the state of education is that. Right. Getting, knowing these children that's saying, knowing the, the administrators, knowing the teachers, knowing the parents, standing out. It's not just standing outside. It's right. leaning over into the window of a car and saying, good morning. Right. Where are you going now? Nice suit, nice tie. Oh, you, you look like you just didn't sleep. Make the joke. Comedy, smiles, make a difference, right? We talked about that before. So if you make that connection, you talk about data points. I love people who talk about data points. Give me a file of a child and let me read their history. Right. And then you can get the same information from a test. I'd like to read the story of the child. Right. Same here. Because that makes the difference. Same because then here. you could say, I know why this child's failing. Now, how do I fix that? Right. Don't tell me there's a data point that says right. your, your, your child is not proficient. Tell me why. Now, how does that resonate? Because now, or in Patterson, we're, we have been taken over by the state for the last 20 plus years. So I think our, our interactions are a little bit different than a, a district that's not state taken over. Because, see, and exactly how you think is exactly how I think with running my building and like I said sometimes that runs counter because everybody all they want is the data points that's all they want they, they could care less about well, the I other think, stuff no, all they want at the, the end I think what they want is success right yeah, well so, yes so it's how but, you get there so how long can you go without looking at the, the and I'm not saying ignore data points I'm saying in the context of you get more from the, the more bang for your buck right so it's at the end of the day when I was in Fort Lee fortunate enough and even Englewood Cliffs right. and now in Englewood things are starting to change and as long as there's a feeling of change, I'll leave you alone. As long as there's the results at the end of the day, I'll leave you alone. So the results came in right. my two other districts. They will come in this third district. And that's where um, they'll say, well, maybe he's right. Yeah, exactly. or, or let's leave it alone because he, he knows. And it's a mindset. It's yes. that same mindset we talked about before. Getting people involved, right. understanding this is where I'm going. This is my vision. I want to work with you, not against you. This is not... It's never going to work, right? Conflict never solves anything. Now, we were laughing whenever, right? Again, I, and Robert and I had a chance to chat for a few minutes before the mics went on. And I was. Before I was, you did I the was, weather. Exactly. <laughs> 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 That's an inside joke between us with the weather here. <laughs> In terms of, I was sharing with him, there's about three or four who are full fledged alumni grown adults here opposed to the stu- exactly <laughs> opposed to the students who are here you know during the week and he and exactly what he just says he says and I told him I said you know in all honesty we are all big kids and where I'm going with this is the teachers really are not much different than our children that we service and, and the reason I say that is you were talking about acknowledgement the teachers are looking for the same thing as the kids are looking for as the parents are looking for exactly and and, and I laugh because we recognize the kids, we will recognize them, and sometimes we fail to recognize the teachers. So what I started doing was shouting them out in morning announcements for little things. I mean, really little things. Like, if you came to your grade level meeting totally prepared, if every teacher in your grade level meeting came prepared, that next morning we shout at that grade level, great job to the fourth grade level team. They were all prepared. They all had their books, their data, their this, that, and that. So what started happening was we started noticing now that it got competitive, and if Mr. Medley, make sure now you're going to shout us out tomorrow morning. I'm going to shout you out tomorrow morning. I'm saying all that to say, and I, I laugh because I was, I was sharing with one of my coaches that works with me. Saying, I said, they're no different from the kids. Uh, in, <laughs> in my book, I talk about in morning announcements that I, I used to, I can't sing. Even though I was a music major, <laughs> I just not my thing anymore. I used to read the lyrics of songs. And I would do all the different genres so that right. parents so that the parents would come in and start smiling. The teachers would laugh. 
Maybe you'll do a Neil Diamond song or right. Bob Dylan or the Beatles, and 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 then the kids would sometimes you do the younger kids one, the Taylor Swift or whatever else they're right. listening to, and they would sing. They would know the song and its lyrics, its literature, right? right? And and if you don't sing it, then the lyrics don't get lost in the right. in the music. And the funny thing was that these kids, the teachers would smile because the the kids would look around. Ask any child if they really know who the Beatles are. Right? right. And they don't. But one child, I'll never forget, one child came running in and said, I know the song. I said, how do you know it? It's my mom's pl- uh, play- uh, ringtones on her phone. <laughs> <laughs> but the teachers were involved because they would call up and say, that's a Neil Diamond song. That's, right. That's, that's, I know that song. That's my favorite. Bon Jovi is my favorite. Uh, you know. And I said, that's getting them involved, making that smile. Remember, we started we started a right. little while ago with happy and you know it, clap your hands, right? Absolutely. It's just realize that this is what we are, right? Now, my conversation with Robert has been so good, I forgot to throw out there, especially since he's in the studio, because I don't do it when yeah, I have Yeah, we got to talk about phone. the book and, and do go we do, to my we're, website. We're and... talking about it. Exactly. And, <laughs> and if you want to call in, if you have a question for him, feel free. You can do that because the lines are open this morning because I'm not using it for the interview. The number is 973-720-2738. And actually, we have been talking about the book. We've been skipping around, hopping around in the conversation. So we've got to mention but, the title again, right? You, yes, we're going to continuously <laughs> mention that. And in terms of... Blue again, Ribbon when, Story, when you, an entrepreneur's success about, in education. When, when you, when, at what point did you feel like, you know what, I need to get this down in book format? Um, after I won the Blue Ribbon. Okay. Because I'd say it, it, it affirmed my belief that said, you know what, everybody's missing the point here. Everybody, right? It is just crazy because I would sit at meetings and I would listen. And these were the years of implementation of Common Core and Park, and everyone kept saying, "This is what we're going to right. do, and this is going to make every child read." And I would take that step back, like I do right. with every parent and every teacher, and say, "Take the breath. Is this actually going to help? Can somebody tell me the why?" And in my office, next to the word "believe," is "ask the why." Correct. Why? And, and it's almost comical when we talk about we want kids college ready. College, right. Can we afford college? Yeah, right. Can we afford college? Are they prepared for college? And if we can't afford it and we're not putting systems in place and we know that the prices of college are getting higher and higher, what are we doing for that? Right. And that's what people don't – they don't ask the second part of the question. But if you come from business – you do your your SWOT analysis, your right. strength, weaknesses, right. opportunities, and threats. What's going to happen? And you make every decision like that. But for some reason, education, and I just use that broad term, doesn't think like that. They are, they are talking about a solution to a problem without really, really being in the trenches. You know, I, I also happen to blog for the Huffington Post, okay. and it's very interesting. One of my blogs was, who do you tell what to do? So just because you watch HGTV, when you have a plumber come to your home, you don't say to him, hey, I watched on Flip and Flop. This is how you should put the, right. the bathroom in. You don't do that. Uh, you don't walk into a restaurant and say, hey, I watch you know, Chopped, and this is what you should really cook. But everybody walks into a classroom and say, this is what you need to do because everybody sat in the classroom. Um, but things have changed, and people need to understand they, they, that kids they, have changed. And as I said before, and I talk about it in the book, when you change the way we do things, when you right. change the way kids don't play outside and don't get the exercise, when you change the way that the, the hard work of actually doing research in a library, yes, that building right. has books. That's right. When, you know, and as I mentioned to you about even school, when you change the idea that you actually have to show up for school every day, right. that changes the perspective of people. And that's what we need to start to think about. That makes the difference. Well, in terms of... because. Our similarities, our commonalities, there are many. And one of them certainly was moving from one field to the next. What I found whenever I came out of the business world into education was I was constantly asking, why do you do it this way? Yep. I mean, I can't, why? the principal came to me and says, okay, you new kid on the block. I want you to take care of, I want you to be in charge of student government, student council. So, okay, great. Do you hold elections? No. So, what do you mean? And this is like in September, October. What do you mean No. We just picked the kids and put them on there. I said, do you understand you're missing an opportunity to teach them the value of voting, the process, and everything? Never thought of that. So I took it over, and we ran campaigns from September to November. And we actually held the election on Election Day. And the kids had a ballot box. They went around. They had lollipops and posters hanging around, vote for me, so forth. They got an appreciation for the whole electoral process running for 
their student council. Then they had to go home that night and tell their parents, make sure you go out and vote. But, I, you know, it was something like, I was like, this is a school and you all are not teaching this through something that's real for them. So it was that's just an example of I was constantly questioning, why do you all do it this way? Well, anybody who realizes that we've cut back on vocational education, right, with something that everybody complains they can't get a contractor. Everybody complains they can't get someone to repair their cars. And yet we've cut back on on, on uh, vocational education. We don't have manufacturing jobs in this country. Yes, but we don't teach anyone right. vocational right. manufacturing <clears throat> skills. So what did you expect? Uh, these are the questions that nobody's asking and saying, wait a minute, let me think this through. Let me make this, let me think this statement uh, different. Let me remake, re-say this statement. Why aren't we doing the things that people want? Why aren't we looking right. at the vocational jobs? Right. And then ex- saying, hey, now we have the workforce to match the manufacturing. But we're not doing that. We miss that so many times. And and that's where I asked the why. And that's what imp- implored me to write the book to say, we have got to think about this differently, everybody. Yes, we Wake do. up, everybody. And my last line of the book, wake, wake up. That's <laughs> wake right. up. I know it's you know, almost 7 o'clock in the morning, but wake up already and but, think but about it. But it's true. And something else you said that, that I've always said, too, in terms of you were saying how everybody feels they can give input as to what should be done in a classroom. And I think as educators, particularly teachers, we do a disservice to our field. Because anybody really thinks they can do it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've heard many people say, well, I've gotten laid off, so if I can't do nothing else, I'll just teach. You don't hear anybody say, well, I got laid off, so I'll be a doctor. Well, I got laid off, so I'll be a lawyer. You don't hear anybody say, but you know, I got laid off, so I'll just teach. Well, I think it's one of those things that, you know, when I teach in university right now for my students at St. Peter's University, I'll ask this first question. Why do you want to be an administrator? Why do you want to be a teacher? What other industry gets slammed as much as we do? Um, and I get it, and I get it, because there's, they're searching for an answer, and, and it's a good scapegoat to blame education, and it is, and I understand that. But at some point, we, we need to stop blaming. We need to stop blaming, and that's, again, what I talk about in the book, mm-hmm. and start fixing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in a, and I work in Englewood in Public Schools. We have a great district. We've had a lot of problems. We've had a lot of problems. So I did a state of the district address, and I actually showed – this is the actual problems. These are the things we have to fix. This is how we're going to fix it. And a lot of people were, sh- were stunned and said, well, no one's ever said that we were bad before. And I said, why not? You know, and I, I, I like to live my life just like I live with education and everything else. There are, there are things that exist that we know about. You know, how do you admit there's a problem? The, there are people who, go, who have a- alcoholic problems, right? right? First thing they have to do is admit they're an alcoholic, and then they can fix it. We have to admit that there's a problem with education, and then we can fix it. And to think that there's a silver bullet right? that's going to magic. Some magical math program is going to make every kid a mathematician is not going to happen. Oh, I agree. Matter, I, I, you know, again, I'm crazy. I'm foolish. I'll, just about anything will come out of my mouth. And a lot of time it is in jest, but there's some truth to it. I contend that there are sales representatives that have vacation homes in Tahiti off a commission they've made of things they've sold to Patterson Public School District. <laughs> there, there are people who make a lot of money on public education. Yes, and, there and, is. And and that is what's scary. As I told you before, I had the second lowest cost per pupil with the second highest test results. And all we did was we made flashcards. <laughs> Everybody. So if the kids got to do their artwork with flashcards, parents got to see what the artwork looked like. Right. Parents knew what they did in class and they practiced the flashcards that they actually made. Guess what? It worked. I think people don't realize that. And, and there's a lot of outside influences hurting education. Right. And they need to stop. No, it's, it's, and it's true. We're talking about kids here. We're talking about even high school kids. And there is a reason why more colleges and universities are offering remedial classes. Because kids are going through, and you want to use their terms, gaming the system. So they get their A's, and then what? And then you talk about the workforce where kids can't write. And if you, listen, if you just read papers or read anything, they don't even know the formats of how to write. Three sentences, double space, three sentences, double space. That's not even a paper. Absolutely. But yet that has become the norm. <laughs> and right. we, need, we need to start to say, wait a minute. You're right. We need to look at this. <laughs> right. Look what's happening, everybody. We are so far gone. But, uh, is you know, 
when I when I talk about this, a lot of people say, "Well, do you think it's over?" No, 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 <laughs> because you know what I know. I know that everybody wants the same thing. Right. It's just putting people in the room and saying, "Do you agree? Can we fix it?" Right. And how do you want to fix it? There is no difference. There is no difference from when I started in Jersey City, who a child a child went home to an empty apartment that the parents were on subsidy. To an affluent district right. where the parent went, the child went home to a one point five million dollar mansion right. with nobody there. Right. Guess what? Both of them had no one there to say "I love you." Right. That's it. Right. And you know what? I get it. Sometimes you won't have a parent, but sometimes you won't have a grandparent. But sometimes you also. I was recently reading a book about. It's where you go yourself. Right. Right. What do you do when you turn around and say, "I want better. I want to make it. I want." When you want, you'll do. Right. That's what you want. That's what we need to think about. And as we're talking, because again, I don't, as you can see, I don't have any questions laid out in front of me. It is totally based on the conversation as we're talking. And you say so many things. It's something popping in my mind as you say it. Uh, in terms of the transparency. The yeah, the weather, right? <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, I got to do the weather at 7 o'clock. <laughs> we got to do that again. The show normally is an hour, but I love the flexibility I have, and we're having an extremely good conversation. If you have the time, sure. we can hang out. But yet, I'm glad you said that, because I do have to do the weather. <laughs> it is 7 o'clock. It is the top of the hour. I was so involved with the conversation, didn't even realize the time, because time really does fly when you're having fun. But yes, it is time for me to do the weather again. So I'm going to do that and then we're going to continue speaking. I have my guest this morning, the superintendent of Inglewood Schools. He's also an adjunct professor as well as an author. And his book, the title is Blue Ribbon Story. Now, those of you who are not in education, I don't think you realize how, when I say difficult, I don't mean to do it, but I mean to obtain the status in terms of there's a whole lot of things that have to be in place to obtain Blue Ribbon status. But to be able to take a failing school to Blue Ribbon is a whole different thing. And his book is An Entrepreneur's Success in Education. And not only did he take a failing school, he, took it, he did it within a year. Now, I, you know, I gave myself like five to seven years. He did it within a year. <laughs> and I was like, because <laughs> I said when I first stepped on the stage in my current school, I said, we're going to be a Blue Ribbon school. And staff looked at me like, you're crazy. But it can be done. And this is a testament to that. And the book, again, is Blue Ribbon Story, An Entrepreneur's Success in Education, Robert L. Kravitz. We're having a good time with an inside joke about the weather. But let me get all of that done so that we can continue with our interview. Now, it is a little bit later in the morning than it was when we started at 6. So if you didn't catch us at 6, tell somebody you should be up by now that they definitely want to tune in to this interview because it is important. If parents... There's three different stakeholders that he's addressing in his triangle. And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we come back as well. WPSC, Wayne, New Jersey. On the radio, 88.7 FM. Online, gobrave.org. A tune-in radio station. Part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. WPSC. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. Straight from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center, here's your local forecast. All right, I told Robert, every time I do the weather from this point on, I'm going to laugh because I'm going to think about him. I'm going to think about him. <laughs> I might let you do the weather. It is 59.5 degrees. Chance of a morning shower, cloudy skies early, followed by partial clearing. 70 degrees as a high, 40 degrees as a low. And then on tomorrow, Sunday, mainly sunny, high of 68 Low of 44, mainly clear early. And then on Monday, 78 as a high, 51 as a low. Sunshine and clouds mixed. Rain showers in the evening, then becoming a steady light rain overnight. Tuesday, rain likely again. Thunder possible, high of 59, low of 40. Evening clouds will give way to clearing, low near 40. And then on Wednesday, sunny skies, high 67, low of 40, clearing up Wednesday night. This weather has been brought to you by the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. All right, and you are indeed listening to GoBrave.org, Brave New Radio. Anywhere else in the world other than right here in northern New Jersey and New York, you're on the computer or on your mobile device 
It is gobrave.org. If you're in the New Jersey area, it is WP 88.7 FM radio. My guest this morning is Superintendents of Schools in Inglewood, New Jersey, Robert Kravitz. And again, this is a book you... It, I always caveat this with like, particularly if you're an educator, but you don't have to be an educator because the principles work, no pun intended. The principles work <laughs> regardless of what you're in. And there was something Robert said earlier, right before we went in there, um, and I'll have to go back in terms of what it was, go back to where we were in the conversation. But one of the things when we're talking about attitudes and beliefs and cultures in the school, Robert, one of the things I tell my people at the school is there's no such thing as a jester. I'm just the janitor. I'm just the food service worker. I'm just the IA. I'm just the resource teacher. I'm just, there's no such thing as a jester. No. No, every, all of us are in this th- thing together. We're all on the ship together. We play different roles, but the custodian is just as important as I am as the principal. Well, that's, that's a classic with the secretary knows more than the principal. Secretary yes. knows more than the, the CEO. I mean, th- they'll give you all the information. I remember when I was applying for jobs as a teacher, I would always call the secretaries. How many people apply? Really, <laughs> tell, me, tell, tell, me, tell me what's the story. Uh, because they knew. That, that was the secret, and, and, and I think that's what people realize. that You know, it's getting everybody on board. Jim Collins writes the, the story of, you know, get everybody on the bus. Uh, I laugh right. because in education, you know, now they're starting to read it and they, over the last 10 years, but that book was actually 30 years ago. But education took a long time to get there. Right. And that's the model. That's when we, we just ended with the silver bullet. What is the silver bullet? There's, in business, we realize there's no silver bullet. Right. But in education, they're looking for the silver bullet. Right. And, and when we stop doing that, that's when we'll see success. Yeah. Now, as you go through the book, if we an talk easy about read. the that's that, my, easy read. That's right. I mean, we're, I mean, when we talk easy read, listen to me. Let me tell you how many pages we're talking. We are talking 87 pages. Yep, 90 pages. You know, 90 pages and off. You come, come, you know, that's you, it. Cover that's to cover. That's it. Cover to cover, 90 pages. If you're an avid reader and maybe an hour and a half, two hours, <laughs> it, there's humor in it. Uh, it's, it's nice. It, has, it doesn't have my picture, but you can Google me at uh, robertkravitz.net. It's a good, easy read book to talk about. Wow. It, 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 will. It, it really is. And like I said, the principles apply regardless because he talks about the triangle in each chapter, each stakeholder group. Are there differences or does the same thing work regardless if it's an administrator, teacher, or parent? Or do you treat them differently? No, they're all the same, just as we talked about. Everybody's the same. I mean, that's, that's part of that humility of understanding people. I, even to this day, when I have parent meetings in my office, I never sit at the head of the table. And I, I even mentioned that in the book. I don't, mm-hmm. I am, di- look, mm-hmm. I am, you know, when we started, I am a regular guy, born and raised in New Jersey, Absolutely. went to state school. Um, you know what? That's what everybody else is. When you try to put yourself above, then you'll never go anywhere. Right? It's true. I, you have, I have, one day you'll have to take a ride to Patterson and come to my school. I'll invite you. It's an invitation. You can come over. Because the things you're talking about, we're, like you were just talking about where you sit in a meeting. I have a rocking chair in my office. And I, I move from behind my desk and I pull the rocking chair and we sit beside each other. Like you said, it's not, not me behind the desk lording over you. It's we're in this together. And as you'll, you'll have to come down one day and take a ride into Patterson and come to the school. And you'll, I'd love to. See, you'll see things. You were talking about love earlier. And I know the listening audience, I know you're tired of the story because you heard it when I'm talking to you. But a few years ago, uh, there was an experiment. There was two guys in New Orleans. And over the, the period, what they did was they had a whole bunch of signs printed up with just the word love on it. They were like, it was white background, red letters, love. And they just started tacking them up on telephone poles and signs all around the city. What they wanted to see was, would subconsciously or subliminally reduce the amount of violence going on in New Orleans. So this is kind of like a social cycle experiment. I saw it on the news and said, you know what, I'm going to do that in my building. So I went back and had 350 signs printed and laminated that said love. So every classroom has it, every hallway, every stairwell, everywhere you go, you'll see the word love. Just love. They don't say anything else beyond it. I hope not. It just says love. That's it. Just love. No words love. before it. Or but yeah, right. None before, none after. Just the words in red letters and white paper, love. But believe it or not, again, back to that culture. Back to the kids are constantly seeing it. The teachers are constantly seeing it. And it has helped. And not Because not just the signs, but it's a constant reminder. And you, after a while, you started hearing parents at the door when they were dropping their kids saying, I love you. Like, ah, oh, there you go. You started, the, the kids started coming up to teachers and to me saying, I love you. You know, thank, I have notes all over my wall and they have thank you cards and, and kids telling me, we love you. You are the best principal, yada, yada, yada. But it makes this, and this is something you wouldn't see in an education book. 
no, but it's but it but you see it. See, you see it subconsciously at the restaurants you go to, right. at the stores you go to, because the stores that say good morning and hello and the people right. behind the counter, they're the ones who you go back to. They're yes. the ones you frequent. If you you always hear, you know, Verizon has a great line that says, for every good thing you do, three people know about it. Right. For every bad thing you do, 33 people know That's about right. it. That's right. So you want to be that, what can I do to make you happy? Hello, good morning, thank you for coming. Did you have, find everything you need? So you feel special, right? Everybody, whether it's a kindergarten kid to a you know a grandparent, or they all want to feel special. So when you have the commissioner education and you've been recognized at the White House and so forth, when you see folks that see what you did and it works, how come it's not picked up upon? Because it's not the norm. Right. It's not the it's norm. Not. It's not the norm. It's, it's not. It's, it, because educators are educators. And, and that's why I always recommend. I, I love people who are not from the education world because they look at it differently. That's and that why nothing, question again. Right. There's nothing wrong. You know, and I, as I said, I teach my, my education classes and say, think differently. Right. Don't think like an educator. Right. Think, don't. Well, let me rephrase that. Don't think like think like you would in business. I had a great professor of college and college at Rutgers for business and he asked the question, how many people want to be salesmen, right? And nobody in the class raised right. their hand. Then he said, how many people want to own their business? And everybody raised their hand. And then he told everybody, for those of you who didn't raise your hand for salesmen, you'll never own your own business because you can't be a salesperson and not own your own business. That's right. what you are. And it was a very, you know, that, that was a very telling speech that he gave about that because it's really who you are. Correct. It's changing that mindset. And I remember I, I went back to Rutgers and lectured a, a, about entrepreneurship. And, and one girl raised her hand in the front row and she said, okay, where can I get a book to be an entrepreneur? I said, it's not about being, you have to feel it. You have to see right. things differently. Look at it. How can I fix? And that's that culture. It's the mindset of... You know, what can I do with the same amount of money? Who, I have a line in my book that a very good friend of mine always uses, and it's a great line. You know, everyone says it's, it's who you know. Right. But there's a better line. It's what do you do with the people you know? Right. Because you may know the President of the United States, but you ever ask him for something? Did you ever work with him on something? Right. And take that experience and do something with it. So what do you do with the people you know? Absolutely. Now, one of the things you talked about earlier just popped back into my mind. You were talking about that whole thing of transparency. <clears throat> As being a part of a state takeover school, there's different plans and things we have to do. And one of the plans is a school improvement because plan. Because you have, you have time for that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we have to do a school improvement plan. And a part of that is called the QSR, Quality School Review. And in that quality school review, you have to put your strengths and your weaknesses. I've always been of the notion, let me write it like it is. And a lot of times you get people that will go in and say, no, that's not politically correct. You can't say that. No, you don't want to make yourself look too bad. You don't, no, no, don't say it. This year, just straight up, I wrote it exactly as it was. So the state representative says, you know, we really appreciated reading your QSR because you were so transparent. You were so plain spoken. Like you didn't just plain every day. It wasn't flowery. It wasn't a whole bunch of high level words and this and that it was just you saw your strengths you saw your weaknesses how important is that to be transparent with every with, the, with your administrators with your parents with your kids with, because they we need to know where we are and where we need to get to that's right it, it's the as I said the alcoholic who admits that they're an alcoholic it's it's fix the problem tell me here's my problem help me you know I as I am I am not a great tech person I know some just like we all have our strengths right. and weaknesses but to try to hide behind it. I've witnessed administrators say, oh, I can, you know, let me do it, I don't know. That doesn't work. That goes back to that secretary who says, right. listen, I wrote his whole paper for him, or I know what to do. You need to be able to say, hey, I'm not a good writer, can you help me? Hey, I'm not a good tech person, can you help me? And e whether you go to the custodian, right. or whether you go to the computer teacher and say, hey, can you do it for me? They get more uh, passion from saying, wow, Somebody actually asked me for help. Empowerment. Empowerment yes. Right? So yes. from the bottom up, I don't, you know, I remember, you know, when we brought in computers into, in both of my districts, I didn't even, I, as a, as a principal or superintendent, didn't even pick the computers. I had said to them, listen, I don't want any part of it. And right. I remember the union came in and said, you're forcing <laughs> us to say, I said, I don't care if you stay <laughs> I, I, I brought in, I brought in Dell, HP, and Apple. Right. I said, anybody who wants to pick? Go sit there with the guy. I'm walking out, and then you come back to me and tell me what you like. They went at it, and right. they came back and said, we like these. I said, okay, then if you like it, we buy it. I don't right. care. I, I I have the money. I have a dollar amount that I can afford. Right. 
but you need to pick. It's not me. It's not about me. It's not about. And you know that's the famous line. It's not. A, it's all about the kids. Well, think about the line and actually implement what you're saying. Absolutely. Because everybody says that, mm-hmm. but nobody actually does that. Absolutely. So when they talk about changing start time for schools, and they say, "Oh, it's it's not about me. It's about the kids. They need more sleep." No, they can actually go to sleep earlier, and and get to school earlier right. and that's it these are the things that people lose track of but see there again and this ties back to the people relationship a lot of times people think once we get these titles that we're like dictators but and that's some, in business again the right. same way <clears throat> some people and some people abuse it they are but then there are others of the same philosophy that Robert and I are talking about where we literally give our power away in terms of no no I want you to make that decision I'm not going to make that decision for you huh yeah, you get a chance to choose. You you like that program? Okay. Those things make such a big difference in terms of what you get back from people. In terms of because a lot of people they're expecting to be told what to do opposed to being a part of the process. And something else you said in terms of of, of the salesman perspective one of the things that I really try to do with our school, because we had such a bad reputation, was to get out there and promote. And constantly, we have a Twitter site, we have our website. If you come to the school, we have electronic boards that everything going throughout the day is on. We have them in four different locations. No wonder why kids can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we have our signboard in front of the school that I'm constantly putting inspirational messages on. But one of the, I really, our school was like, you had school three? Yep. Ours was school four. And school four had a used notorious, to say school four. There's the door. Yes, <laughs> notoriously bad reputation for school four. So years ago, the school was renamed after the first African American superintendent in Patterson, Dr. Frank Napier. So last year, not this past school year, but last school year, the first day in our professional development, we had a number four burning ceremony. We literally had pieces of paper that had number four on there, and we went out in the yard and we put that in the garden. And I told the folks who knew the school and loved the school school for we're not disparaging that we're not trying to take away that history but what we are trying to do is write our new history going forward so going forward we're not going to be known as school four we will be known as the dr frank napier junior school of technology or shorten it we call it napier academy so i get in touch with central office and I'm like, well you can't do that the state won't recognize i said i don't care if the state recognizes or not that's what we're going to call it sure enough after we did it, the state did recognize it as that. So now in all the documentation is DFN or either Dr. Frank Napier Junior School. Center. We did that again, back to mindset. We wanted you to have pride. Everything we have on it has Frank Napier, Napier Academy or what have you. We don't, anybody that comes in and says school for it, we're not school for it anymore. We're Dr. Frank Napier. It, it, again, helped with the mindset, helped with the pride. But we have to do, he said it earlier in terms of singing on morning announcement. We're human. We can do dorky things. And that makes... It gives you so much more of a connection with people. Well, that's that's, and I, I keep refer- referencing businesses, but that's what businesses do, right? The great corporations, right? When you st- see the stories of Google and people who work for Apple, they don't dress right. When I, when I negotiated the contract with Ben and Jerry's, right? So I had a small business. I'm sitting there, and I walk into the Ben and Jerry's facility in, in New York City, and they have a indoor little driving range, right? Right? They're all they're <laughs> right. all in flannel shirts, <laughs> right? right? They, they, nobody's dressed. I walked in with a suit. <laughs> and that was the mindset, but they loved it. They loved right. working for it. Right. And 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 changing a mindset is that's change. That's change. Right. And how do you how do you bring about change? Time, you know. And that's the same thing with the parent. They'll come in crying. And there's a lot of problems, and and they'll say, "What can I do?" And what I want instant results. The only thing that can cure everything is time. Correct. And people need to step back. Correct. As I said before, back to the magic take, bullet thing. Take right. That, take that breath and say, "Okay, what am I? How am I going to plan it out?" Right. Another important issue you brought up, a lot of people think it's, so, oh my God, it's the country club teaching in the suburban schools. No. Regardless if you're urban or suburban, each has their own issues, but they're issues nonetheless. There, there is no, there is no, first of all, there, in my life, there has nothing been easy, right? Right. There's no easy job. Right. There's no easy career. There's no easy nothing is easy if it was easy again another uh, same professor actually from Rutgers I remember one of my friends from Rutgers said to him he said what do you want to do when you graduate he said I want the easiest job where I can make the most money <laughs> and the professor turned to him and said if you find that you let me know <laughs> no, but, that's, that's right. but that's what people look for right oh you, you you live in a beautiful town and you or you you're that town you teach in is they, nobody they complain Everybody right. complains. That's the nature of people. It's, right. it's whether or not you get bothered by it, right. whether or not you can handle it, whether or not you can move past it and then solve those problems. 
is what makes the great ones, and that's what you want. You want great teachers. We just we were talking before we started about there's no time anymore for okay right? because of technology, right? Technology has changed the world because the okay gave you, allowed you time to go research. Right. Now it's instant research. Right. So there's no more okay. Know your craft. Know what you're doing. That's what's changed in society. And and we can, I can, I'm sure you know you can find out if somebody plagiarized in 30 seconds. Oh, now, absolutely. Right? You type the first three lines in Google. Absolutely. And you say, oh, you plagiarized. <laughs> Where it used to take me months to go back and look at the... Per- so that that's what's changed, oh, and people need to realize yeah, it's that. True, and that that brought back to mind something you said earlier too, in terms of the students, in terms of what they have to do. I remember when I was teaching language arts. I would assign a book report, and the kids would come back, literally with something they printed off the web. Said, "Mr. Medley, here's my report." That's not your report. That's a part of your research. They actually thought what they pulled off and printed offline was their report. <laughs> well, I, I remember starting in Jersey City, and the kids. You know, there were some academic issues there. And the kids would come into me with a paper. Now, this is high school seniors. Right. And they were writing at a fourth or fifth grade level. Oh, yes. Oh, oh but yes. But you know what? Those who wanted to wrote. So then I remember going to another district, more affluent district, and the kids came in with what you said, something printed offline. Right. Then I went to a more affluent district, and the kids would actually have, well, the parents would walk in with the report. And I kept saying, I'll take that fourth or fifth grade level right. from, the, from the 18 year old right. who gave me what they could. That's where it was worth something. And I remember having these discussions with, at that time, my principal in Jersey City who, who would say, This is unacceptable. And say, But they gave it. This is the raw. Now, what do you do with it? But again, when we try to pigeonhole everybody right. and say, This is what you need to do, that's not going to work. Right. Start with what you have and the entrepreneur and mold it into something. So when I taught business in an, in an inner city, right. Jersey City, where the kids were coming you know, from disadvantaged backgrounds, they knew what they know. They knew what they knew and they, they worked with it. Right. So when we did the stock market here, we took fourth place in the state. And now the number one high school in the district, in the state, Teneflight, took first place. Right. So my, my guys were talking about what's a better buy because we were just talking about stocks. Right. They were doing a data analysis of every stock. But we took fourth place. And I kept saying, see the difference? You did it, though. You know Absolutely. It. it goes back to what we were talking about before. Just know the data. You don't need the, you don't need the data points from a standardized test. You need to know. Right. Know. Have some knowledge. Right. You, street smarts goes a long way. Absolutely. Right? Put it all together. And so, it, it's so, it's so, it bothers me as an educator, bothers me as an administrator, that we don't take that into account. I agree. It's, it's the same here. When you're, and I know we've been talking about it the entire time in the interview, as a matter of fact, the book does that, but when you're mentoring principals or you have the opportunity to work with your colleagues on the superintendent level, what, do you, what is your advice to them? And my guess would be this. I, well, I <laughs> give them the book. I, I mean, but, it, but it just, the book is an easy read, right? Mm-hmm. And the book is something very simple, but it's changing that mindset. There are people who will read the book and still say, no, 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 it can't be. Right, I, I still, I know. You know I, I know that if I'm the principal, I have to sit at the head of the table. Right? No, you don't. You don't. And it ta- and right. But but it goes back to time. Right. Right. Time and experiences. So you can only tell them because you don't force change. You don't say you must sit over there. Right. But then when they come to my office, I'll never sit there. Right. And you hope that one day it's going to click and say, you know what I learned from him. Right. It, I learned right. that. Just like it goes back to your own kids. Right. You could say a hundred times to my, I've said to this week alone, I think a thousand times to my son, clean your room. Clean your room, yes. Clean I'm your the room, same with my right? daughter, yes. Right? <laughs> but but the one day when he grows up, he's going to say, you know what my dad did? Every day he told me to clean the room. Right. So that's what, that's what it is, right? It's very, it's just going back to basics. It really it's is. It's basics how you teach your kids. It's basic how you, you teach your own kids, your kids, what parents want. We want right. simple. I, I, I used to let. <laughs> do you know what the most popular Ben and Jerry's flavor was? No, vanilla. Gah. Because you know why people got confused right. with all of the funky flavors in there. Right. So vanilla was the most. And popular. see that again, you affirmed and <laughs> confirmed. I was I was sharing this analogy the other day with with one of the teachers. I said, you know what the problem? Because you talk about the state of education. So you know what the problem in my mind? Of education? It's almost like if you're trying to make a soup. And you have you're asking to you're talking to a chef. Remember? Yes. Okay. Okay, That's right. Culinary. (laughs) Okay. So then you'll appreciate this. It's as if everyone walks into the kitchen and put a different ingredient into the soup, and then the soup is ruined. No, but keep going with it. 
Everybody walk, pour, walks into the kitchen, but nobody eats it. And then you're the guy who has to serve it. Yeah, right. And so now the soup is ruined and everybody's like, well, what happened? You put too many ingredients in. You have ingredients in there that didn't need to be in there. There's too many. And you had too many people putting ingredients in. And so now the soup is ruined and everybody's wondering why. You had too many. That, to me, education like We have too many ingredients and in going back to the basics again. Well, so I, I always just ask this question. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, America was ranked in the top 10. Right. We were teaching right. rote mathematics. Right. We were teaching diagramming sentences. We were, everyone did cursive handwriting, maybe even 35 years ago. Who said it was bad? Uh, right. Cause somebody. I'd like to know if it, somebody made a decision that that was bad. <laughs> and I don't know who, but we should talk to this person and find out. Because... That's, by the way, when you look at, again, the comparison to other industrialized nations, right. that's what they're still doing, and right. they outrank us. So, though, as I said, there are countries, whether it's Western Europe or Asia, who are re- memorizing poetry and, and standing in front of a classroom and saying, this is what you have to do. So why did we get rid of it? No, it's true. <laughs> and then, uh, wait, how come, how come they're in the top five and we're not? I don't know, but they're doing the same thing we were doing. It's true. It's true. And I tell folks all the time, there's a call. I said, first off. You cannot make me believe that all the teachers I had whenever I was a kid were bad teachers. And you also can't make me believe that every other student that I went to school with was an idiot and I was the outlier. You can't make me believe that. that just, but that is almost as if what it's saying with everything that's come into it now. Like whatever you all did whenever you were in school as children, we have to do away with that and we need all this. Back to the basics again. We don't teach cursive writing. We don't teach multiplication by rule. I can remember to this day, and I've shared this story as well sitting at the kitchen table with my father and I got to the four timetables and I got stuck on the four timetables I started crying and crying. he said I don't care how much you cry you're going to learn these timetables and to this day I can go through my times tables <laughs> my kids today to this day still remember and I, except for my youngest who's seven who we didn't get there yet right. we were working on it but the, I, I sat there with my iPhone and said we're going to time you time right. it. you need to do all these timetables Flashcards, flashcards. Last summer alone, my son was moaning to me that every day, Daddy makes me do. Right. I don't care. Right. It's the basis of algebra. It's the basis of all That's this stuff. That's right. And so what? That's I'm a parent. So what? I'm a teacher. So <laughs> what? That's what works. That's right. And and that's what people. I don't know why. State of education. That's what I talk about in the right. book. Right. I don't know why we're missing these. Simple I, I don't things. either. I, I well, if really you don't and I don't, let's start a new yeah, world. Yeah, I right? know it's true, and I think we actually we have based on what we do in our building. One of the things, and I get, I know it works as you go up the line because I really struggled when I was working in my M Ed program of whether I wanted to leave the classroom to go into administration. So the dean, he, you know, we were talking about it. And he said, "Well, look at it this way." As a teacher, you get to influence 15 to 30 kids at a time. As a principal, you get to, entire, you get to influence a building. Like, wow, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way. And there are times I'll walk around the building now and I'm like, wow, I've actually influenced this. I've had the opportunity to influence. And I imagine it's the same thing at the superintendent level. Now, you know, you can, okay, you can influence 500 kids in your building, but as a superintendent, you get to, how many did you say that in the district? 30? Uh, 3,500. 3,500. You get to influence 3,500 there. It's the same type principal. But um, we, I'm saying all that to say we are, we based are. on where we lead. And that's why you asked the question, why did you write the book? And all. Right. I wrote the book to say, wake up, world. These are things that somebody needs to bring that you all know. It's in you. Every yes. one of us has it in you that you, knew, you know what's right. Right. So let's go back to what was right. Let's think about it. That's a great segue because we come down to the end of this segment. Right. This is the where weather you again? have the, No, I don't have to do the weather yet until <laughs> 8 o'clock. But... What has come? What I'm going to do is I'm going to buy three more copies of this from you, because I'm going to share it with my three administrators. And every year I do a book study with the teachers when, where I order one or two books. I may, you know, once I go through it with my administrative team, I may order because whenever my book budget comes up, I may get a copy for every teacher too. There you go. Because um, again, it's an easy one. We can do this in grade level meetings. We can do it in chat, you know, staff meetings, or whatever. But I know I'm going to order three more copies to give to each vice principal. It's an easy one. And the four of us are going to go through this. There you this, go. this is going to be, when you're talking about changing, this is going to be exactly how we do it. But So you can you can rest assured that at least three more copies of this is going to be sold. <laughs> <laughs> and it All might right, be that's the businessman in that's me. Right. <laughs> at least three more are going to be, because each of my vice principals, we're going we're gonna to work this together because I'm constantly mentoring them as well right. in terms of, and again, just like you said, after a while of seeing somebody, you do begin to kind of take on their ways because I listen 
listen to some of the things the vice principals will say, and I was like, wow, they really are listening. I'll see some of their actions. Like, oh, So this is going to be a part of that. And I laughed when you were talking about your son in your room. The other morning, uh, you know, the way my house is laid out, the, the kids' rooms are are like down a hallway so I walked like right where my closet is so I'm walking to my closet getting my clothes out for the morning and my daughter quickly runs and closes the door to her room so I see her a couple minutes later I said you know if you kept it clean you wouldn't have to worry about trying to close it for me not to see it <laughs> so it's the basics it it's really the basics is. as if they're smarter than you right, right. so she just gives me a look I said well you know you wouldn't have to run the closet so fast if you kept it clean so <laughs> but it really is the basics. It's the basic things, and it's just if we stick with the basics, right. it will work. I guarantee it. I've, and you know how I guarantee it? Because I did it. Absolutely. That, exactly. And and back to the message, because I, what I tagged it with, I said, look, one day you're going to have your own apartment or house, and we're trying to train you now <laughs> so that whenever you're out on your own, you'll have a clean place. You'll have a nice... This is your opportunity as the businessman to promote. You can say anything with the exception of the dollar amount, but in terms of websites, book signings, any other information you want to share about an entrepreneur's success and education, the Blue Ribbon Story, this is your opportunity to do that. Go to my website, robertkravitz.net, www.robertkravitz.net. You can order the book from there. It's available on Amazon.com. Uh, it's a great book, easy read. You read the Kirkus reviews. I've been on with in the Washington Post with Steve Adubato, with all kinds of different people talking about the simple version of how to flip a school. And this book is for parents. It's for teachers. It's for administrators. It's anybody, as the, the, the Mark started with, anybody who cares about education, which, by the way, should be everybody. Because how do we change the world? With education. And if you care about education, read the book. I guarantee you, you'll be done in two hours. It's an easy read. He's right, and it's just an, and enjoy the book. It has humor. It's funny little stories about how you get hired and how crazy things are. But I, I, I hope the, the audience enjoys the book. I am sure you will. Again, I recommend this one highly. And as I said, I, I generally wind up downloading or purchasing whoever my guests come because I like to support. We we need to support each other. But I can tell Robert right now, guaranteed at least three more. And a larger <laughs> order may be coming over the summer. Great. Because uh, I really am a believer in book studies and uh, thoughts being shared in this manner. So you've given me a lot of things, even as we were talking, some ideas to go back and implement. Because truth be told, there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel. If something is working for Robert in Inglewood that can work for me in Patterson... I don't think he would mind if I implemented that, no. and vice versa. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. You use the same model. Right. I mean, so I am going to get this book, and there's, like I said, in my school, there are four administrators. So the four of us are going to go through this at our six-day cycle administrative team meeting. We're going we're gonna to start on these chapters once I get my three copies, the other three copies of the book. But I appreciate you for coming out and for coming live into the studio. You have an open invitation to come back. If you do some other work, another book, we can oh, talk about be that. Coming. Yes, All I'm right, on. so I'll we'll have you back on for sure. You have an open invitation to come to my building that I have the opportunity to serve and lead in. And uh, again, I would love for you to come take a walk around and you can see that I'm not just saying these things because you're saying them, but this is, I operate in pretty much the same manner. And uh, again, for those of you listening, Robert got it. <laughs> he got it. He really does. I'm telling you that what we're talking, many people think is fluff. They think it's, you know, handsy pansy, you know, fooey. It's not. The stuff that we're talking about, if you get that, you'll get the data points. You'll get the academics if you put in place the stuff that we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. Well, if you're a parent, you should be asking for this. That's the parent piece asking for that if you can't do the math homework with your with your kids go tell your principal go tell your teacher hey why don't you have a math program i can do with my kids right absolutely <laughs> oh and you know and if we could you know if i get on the parent kick we'll be here for another half hour to an hour because parents generally have more of a voice than the teachers and administrators yes they do because generally the superintendent or either the principal or whatever to say whenever we come complaining mm, you know what you probably just don't want to do your job or you're looking for an easy way out but when a parent comes to a school board microphone and says something or a group of parents it gets heard and, and, and when acted it's not, upon when it's not you know screamed and a, a valid point to say hey right I can't do the homework with my kid. And if your presentation was given by a parent right. at hockey presentation to say, can you solve this problem? 
and the board members can't, and the superintendent can't, guess what? <laughs> Time to change. <laughs> Uh, that's absolutely right. And as, as Robert was just talking about in terms of that's one of the things I work with our PTO is I look, if you're going to have parents go to the mic, let's work with them before they go up because yep. it is the approach going up there, cursing and hollering and screaming. Mm, that's not the approach. Right. Go there with information, factual, calm, solutions. lay out your case and solution. Right. Exactly. You will get heard. Trust me on that one. But if you go in there just yelling and screaming in the mic and calling the superintendent names and all that, they're not going to pay any attention to that. So it is the approach. Well, again, I thank you so much. I'm definitely going to stay in touch with you. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't bring my business card with me, but we have each other's email addresses and LinkedIn and all of that. But I, you, know, you just never, from a business perspective, we're always networking. You never know who can do what for who when. And <laughs> so I'm definitely going to stay in touch with you. All right. All right. That's pretty much it for this edition of The Reading Circle. When I come back, as you all know, Prince passed away this week. We'll probably do a little bit of something on Prince. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I'll probably put on Purple Rain somewhere in there. And then we'll go on into the gospel music, as we always do. So hang out. Don't you dare leave. Listen to the music a little while as I let Robert out. And we shall return shortly.